Hi everyone, this is Adam Law with Wanderings. I have a very interesting topic for you guys today. And the topic is enlightenment. I have a number of uh, friends I've been speaking to about the topic of enlightenment. And they introduced me to a guy named Awakened. He is a uh, YouTube content producer and he claims to be uh, awakened or enlightened and he speaks a lot about a philosophy. He's got, I don't know, close to a million um, subscribers, a popular guy. And I haven't followed and listened to a lot of his stuff. To be honest with you, it personally irks me. Also, I think a lot of what he says has problems philosophically. So here, I'm going to uh, try to, here I'm going to show a clip of something that he said in a recent video. It was about six months ago that a friend sent me, but I'd also seen other videos. Now, I haven't seen all of his stuff, but I've seen enough here to I feel to address this issue, at least in a uh, more global way and specifically to some of the claims that he makes here. <laughs> Testing, is this thing working? Test, test, okay, seems to work. Hold on, let me see how much battery I got. <laughs> This is recording. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I want to. I want to capture this because it's so funny. Uh, so I just uh, <laughs> minutes ago, moments ago, and this is probably for a good 15 minutes now. <laughs> I've been. I've been going. I've been going through a total awakening. Hold on. What is? What is at my door? Uh, so how to explain this? Uh, so, yeah, about about 15 minutes ago, <laughs> I had a complete awakening. <laughs> I entered this complete, complete self-understanding of everything about reality and about myself. I just want to describe it. It's it's so epic and big. It's uh, there's a loss for words for it. Uh, even my body is still trembling. It's hard to contain. It's hard to contain the emotion and uh, the significance of this because it's utterly, utterly spectacular. Utterly, I mean, wow! It's like wow, <laughs> complete awakening, complete awakening. <laughs> It's too good to be true, and yet it's at the same time it's absolute truth, <laughs> and it can't be anything else. It's the complete realization that you are God. So right now I'm completely conscious that I am God, and I'm completely conscious of how I'm creating the entire universe. <laughs> anything that could ever possibly exist, I am, and it's absolute perfection. Uh, pure, infinite consciousness is what I am. I am absolutely everything, and I'm conscious of absolutely everything. <laughs> I'm completely omniscient. I know everything that's happening in the entire universe all at once, because I am all of it at once. And I am the only thing that exists because I am perfect, infinite oneness. And there is no alternative or opposite to me. I am wisdom. I am intelligence. I am perfect self-love, perfect self-love, I am immortal, I am eternal, I am unlimited, I am self-created, I created myself, I gave birth to myself, I gave birth to all beings, through consciousness, I am imaginary. I am pure imagination, <laughs> pure creativity, <laughs> pure effortless. I'm a superconductor. This, this, this body, this Leo avatar, is just a consciousness avatar, which is a perfect superconductor for the absolute, which has no form. The absolute, God itself, the Godhead, is completely formless and infinite but it needs some vehicle through which to speak to you, therefore it's doing it 
through this vehicle and it's listening through that vehicle. But really, all of this is just God. And the only thing that's preventing you from understanding this right now is internal resistance of your own mind or what we might call karma. <laughs> I became, I became completely omnisciently, perfectly understanding of what karma is, what my own personal karma was. So you'll see here in the video, he claims that he is God, that he create, is creating the world, that he's enlightened. Um, it doesn't matter if he's killed because since he's all one and everything is one, whatever kills him is also him. It's all God since he's all one. And uh, he also says in another video, not shown here, that it doesn't matter if he has children or not, because if he's all one, he's everything. And as long as the world continues, it is like he is having children. So it doesn't really matter such things. Um, and really nothing matters. And in one of his videos, he says that it doesn't matter what actions you do, so to speak. It doesn't matter if you do, uh, in, in Judaism, we'd call mitzvahs, actions, positive actions, because it doesn't really matter. It's all God. So I guess naturally, um, if, to answer the question of, well, what good is that then? You know, why do good at all? They would probably answer typically, well, when you get to the state of joy, and you can see in this video that he's laughing and, and stuff like that, you get to a place where you're just sort of enlightened and spiritual and then beneficial and full of light. So you're going to do naturally good things to the world. You're going to be good to the world. So... Um, in discussing this with the two friends who brought him up, again, one person brought it up, I guess, six months, a year ago and showed me a few videos, again, which triggered me a little bit. And that one, I specifically got in a debate with him about this idea of from the awakened guy that you don't need to do actions. And as a Jewish person who believes in the Torah and doing actions in the world, I had a argument, philosophical argument, which I will get in here today to discuss with that. The other friend uh, who brought it up recently a few days ago also said same, basically the same thing, that when you get to an enlightened state, you realize that all is one, all is God, you're the creator, you're the you know, essence of all, that um, it says maybe Jews misunderstood Jesus because Jesus, um, according to what people understand, you know, claims also that he's God. And maybe he didn't mean he's God as in like the God, you know, but he meant that he's part of the oneness, the allness that is God. And maybe, therefore, Jews have a misunderstanding of Jesus' claim. So I'm going to address both of these, and then I'm going to try to examine the question of, do Jews believe in the concept of enlightenment, that everything is one, that we're all one, and we're all really part of God? Okay, so here's a little adventure today. I hope you enjoy the video. Okay, first of all, I'm going to address the idea of what Jesus said or didn't say regarding um, him being God. Now... Once you actually study um, historically, from the historical critical method, the uh, New Testament, you see that there are very few references in the Gospels which tell the story of Jesus to him being God. Um, the only real book of the four which speaks about that is the book of John. And there, which by the way is, one of the, is also one of the most anti-Jewish, we call it anti-Semitic today, but in its time I guess we would call it anti-Jewish books at the time. He speaks very strongly um, that Jesus was preeminent, that he was at the beginning, and it speaks there about the Jews at the time arguing with him and trying to stone him because he said that he was God, and Jesus doesn't deny that. So clearly, the, the author of John, the Gospel of John, believes that. But if you look at the other three Gospels, which are called the Synoptic Gospels, because they all have sort of a, a similar synopsis, they come from a source which is generally called the Q source, there are very few references at all to anything other than Jesus being a teacher, being a rabbi, being a uh, rabble rouser or prophet, uh, maybe a hidden messiah, or maybe an open messiah, having some special abilities, coming back from the dead, etc. But to say that Jesus said that he himself was God is definitely not clear in the three gospels. God, there's very few references to such a major idea. My point being is that it's not so clear that Jesus ever thought that he was God. Though most people generally believe the Christology, the idea that Jesus was said he was God, is really an idea found in Paul and later authorities as well. It's really sort of a Roman idea that Jews it really don't find any references in any Jewish um, tradition whatsoever saying that a person could be God. Matter of fact, it's explicitly against that. 
And even the Gospel of John, which is the only place where it says that Jesus said that he was God, says there very explicitly that the Jews were very upset that Jesus was saying that. So it's very unclear that Jesus ever said that. That may have been something put on him. So I just want to push that aside, the idea that, that Jesus ever said that. Let's get to the heart of this enlightened view from our friend at Awakened and other people who may have a similar view. It's not necessarily just him at Awakened, but really anybody who would hold this view that we are all one, we are all God, that it doesn't matter what we do in this world because it's all one. And not surprisingly, he wasn't the first person to think that. But there was a view uh, called Stoicism. I'm not an expert in Stoicism, um, but I remember when I studied philosophy in university that they, would, they said the Stoic philosophy that everything is all one, it's all the same, it's all equal, so it really doesn't matter. And I think there was a philosophical story where someone said to a, a Stoic, they said, well, if that's true, why don't you just walk off a cliff, right? It doesn't matter what you do, and he wouldn't do it. So clearly, they don't really believe that. They still see, if everything is one, I want to follow that to the end. It doesn't matter who I am, what I do, what my actions are in the world if I'm a Stoic, or if I'm this guy, the awakened guy. But the second main question, argument we have on this idea that all is one, it doesn't matter is, if all is one in the world, then why do we have the illusion that the world is separate, that it's not all one. Why do we have physicality? Why do we have egos? Why are so few people enlightened? Why do so few people get it? I guess, you know, the great figures, like they would say, Jesus or Buddha or whatever, they would say, these guys got it, they understood. But the rest of us, we don't. So you kind of have to come to this conclusion that if, if that's true, then God is a deceiver. If we're all God, then God must be a deceiver because why would we deceive ourselves to think that this body is not God? Why would we deceive ourselves to live in a world and chase after physicality, sexuality, materialism, kavod, honor, things that don't matter? Why would we think like that unless God is evil? And the problem is in the Western tradition, we believe that God is good and it's all good. So if you want to say that God is evil and God is a deceiver God, then I could understand and saying, well, but then why would I want, you know, what I... I'm God, I have to get rid of my deception, of my self-deception in order to realize that I'm really God. How do we answer the problem of physicality, of materialism, of ego, that I see and perceive myself as separate from God, and very few people actually get it, get past that screen? It's interesting, well, back to Greek philosophy, is there was an actual idea called the allegory of the cave, and it's this idea of this deceiver God who, or, who sets up the world in a way this deceiver God sets up the world in a way that um, we're living in a cave and everything we see is just shadows being projected like on a screen. And the truth is, with philosophy, they held you can escape the cave and get out. And that's where movies like The Matrix and this idea of, you know, Red Pill, etc. is like, get out of the Matrix, get out of this blindness, the shadows that we see are the world, and realize the real reality beyond that. As well, you can see the idea, the basic idea there is that you have to, again, say that God is a deceiver. He set up the world in a way as a test as a test to fool you. So if you want to say God is good, it's very hard to say that God would deceive us. Similarly, you find a very difficult philosophy back to Christianity in the Lutheran's view of Paul. Uh, Professor Daniel Boyarin pointed out that if you look at the letters of Paul, it depends really kind of where you start in the corpus. Some places, Paul attacks the law very strongly and says it's basically like worthless and now that we have this guy, we don't need it anymore. But other places, he gives some value to it, particularly for the Jews. But in his last magnum opus of the uh, of Romans, he does say there's value, and the Torah is not going to be canceled. By no means is it going to be canceled. So what's going on here? Like again, Boyarin points out it depends where you start in the Pauline corpus, but you you have to understand there that according to the Lutheran view, they see the Torah as a sort of a deception that God created as a deception in order for the reality of the Christian message to come along. And this is extremely problematic for the same reason is that you're gonna say that God's a deceiver. Why did he set up a world of physicality, of materialism, of Torah, where there's an involvement and engagement with mitzvahs, with the proper deeds? Why would God do that? Why would God do that if it's really just to get enlightened? And you see this also in Paul. You see this, you know, he says it's better not to get married, the next world is what matters, this world doesn't matter, we'll just all be martyred, doesn't matter. Right? It's like a next world philosophy. Then you have to ask the question, what does the value of this world hold? 
But again, it's putting God as a deceptor. God gave the Torah as a deceiver. God gave the gave this physical world as a deceiver. He's testing you. He's testing you. It doesn't accord well with this idea that God is good. So with all these questions, all these problems, this idea that awakened and the Lutheran school and Paul and everyone says about, you know, this world doesn't really matter and it's all one, it's all good, it's okay. Let's get to the Jewish point of view. Let's see what Judaism has to say about, is it possible to get awakened? Is it possible to get enlightened? Can anybody get there? What's up with that? So I have a close friend in Israel and he tried the drug DMT. DMT gets a person to an extremely deep um, psychedelic state where they basically see at least they believe they see the fabric of the universe and the oneness of the universe and how everything is sort of all interconnected and an epiphany moment which a person can have through meditation through spirituality through prayer but sometimes certain drugs that people are taking and I'm not advocating taking anything they get them to the state where they see everything as one so this friend came to me and he told me on his DMT experience that he got this point where he realized that all is one and it really doesn't matter. That doing mitzvahs doesn't matter but it's all one. It's all God. A very, very deep part of the Gemara is Gemara Chagiga, second parak. And there it talks about all the mysteries of the Kabbalah, the Merkava, the Bereshis, etc. And there it gives the famous Brisa, which many people know, about the four who entered the Pardes, the four people who went to Paradise. And the commentators, most of them explain that they went to a, a spiritual meditation, they rode the Merkava, they got to this high spiritual place, up above where they saw the angels and the worlds, and they felt this oneness and connection with God. Three of the four, Ben Zoma, Ben, um, ben Azai, and Acher, didn't make it. They all got off in a little bit. And different things happened to them. They either died, went crazy, became a heretic. Only one made it out as the famous Bryce who goes, Rabbi Kiva, out of this spiritual oneness state, this deep meditation of being connected to the Most High. So it's interesting, in this art scroll, it's, on, it's in the art scroll Hagiga. Um, it brings out a note on page 15a, 3. And there it says there, for Acher, that, he, that when he got to this high place, when he got to this super high spiritual place, this note, note 30 in the art scroll says, he forsake the observance of the mitzvahs. Rab Tzadok explains in Sefer HaZichronos, page 63, that after his Merkava experience, Acher thought his connection with the upper worlds made his observance of halacha unnecessary. Meaning, that when a person gets the super high spiritual one state, the mistake they might make is that that is for this world. The truth is, it is true. It's all one. It's all connected to God. It's all, nothing matters. But that's for the next world. That's the next world's opinion. In this world, we have to live entrapped in our body and we have to work within that system. And that was the mistake Acher made. Is he stopped doing mitzvahs. And this is, it's funny because this is the exact thing my friend told me. When he got to that state on his DMT experience, he told me he didn't really need to do mitzvahs anymore because he had gotten into oneness. He realized that all is one. The truth is you, there is the reality that God is all one and it's all one. And, but that doesn't mean in this world we have to stop. So let's talk more about that. Nalav Nevihu is another example of that. Nalav Nevihu, on the highest day, they consecrated the Mishkan, Rosh Chodesh Nisan, the year after they left uh, Mitzrayim, and they went inside the Holy of Holies on the holiest day and experienced this total oneness experience, this deepest connection experience. And there, they died. They burned up. And there's given various reasons. One reason was that they were drunk. Another one, they didn't have children. They weren't married. They didn't listen to their rebbies. The main point is they just wanted to become one and burn up in that oneness, the highness. But they didn't want to connect themselves to this world. That seems to be the mistake, again, we're finding with Acher as well, is that these are incredibly high people, but they go to this high spiritual state and they believe that once they're there, they don't need to do anything anymore. They don't need to be connected anymore. So do Jews believe it is possible to get enlightened to this world? Well, it's something I've been studying for years and wondering. I'd say yes and no. I remember hearing in yeshiva about certain gadolim that got to such a high spiritual level of light that they were basically complete Torah. They didn't need some big fancy uh, place and money. 
lots of followers. They just lived in their little apartment, had a family, and did mitzvahs. That's what they did. Were in Torah. That's what they did. That's what they got involved in. And it's interesting because these same people aren't looking for glory. They're not making videos of it. They're not advertising it. They're not making big books about their enlightenment. They're just being really connected. Matter of fact, the Sefer Tanya does actually also speak about that there are enlightened people. In every generation, there are a few tzaddikim who are planted in the generation, and those people are enlightened. They don't need to be here, because anyone who's here needs to work on themselves. These people don't need to be here. They're just planted as special tzaddikim. I think Noam Ali Melech and the Reb Zusha, the story goes, were two of these Rebbe's who basically, they said, jumped out of Adam before the sin of Adam. And therefore, they were basically on the spiritual level of Adam before the sin, whereas the rest of us are. So these very enlightened people that Tanya speaks about that are planted in each generation, maybe they have the ability to guide us. This is just a few sources, though. There's also an idea of Das Torah. You know, we saw in Parsha Shoftim, and Rashi there says, you know, you should follow what your Rebbe does no matter what he says, even if he says left is right or right is left. Nevertheless, this is, it's complicated because Das Torah, I mean, this idea that someone's enlightened enough to bring down God's reality into the world to the point where you should listen to everything they say, we see many mistakes that people make throughout the Torah. And there are even special sacrifices people bring. So can people be enlightened? Not so clear. Tanya certainly seems to say so, and other sources like that seem to say so. But yet, there are other sources which say, no, we can't really be 100% enlightened because there are sacrifices. And we see the mistakes people made. People like King David and other figures in the Torah, they made mistakes. To wrap up that question, we see with Avram Avinu, the first command he gets from God is lechacha, right? And he says, go to the land. And he says, asher arecha, the land which I will show you. And it's interesting, at the end of his final 10 tests, it also says lechacha to the land. And there, when he fulfills the mitzvah of following God and bringing the um, korban of his son, and he follows God's command in this most insane of all situations, and there it says, now I know you, you're Elohim. The same language of, of arecha, I will show you or I will enlighten you, is the language of yira, which or like ria, like seeing, like fear, like awe and deep connection, that it is possible to get to a super high level. And that's what Avraham Avinu set for us. And when somebody gets there, they're not needed in this world anymore, except maybe as a guide. Maybe when somebody gets that level, they're only needed as a guide. Maybe they leave this world. Maybe they're not for this world anymore. They're completely spiritually enlightened. Unless you want to hold like the Tanya and say that there are people in each generation as a guide as well. They don't really need to be here. But you can't consider those people as part of the regular human experience, right? Why the rest of us take so much to get, to get there? Matter of fact, also Avram Avinu, it says there he was Babi Yamim. He was coming each day, meaning as he was growing each day. It's not about getting enlightened. I'm not so sure, I'm not sure at the end of this whether people can get enlightened or not completely. Maybe they can get planted in the world as, as enlightened people, but can we, the regular people, become enlightened, become those people? There's some sources of Rabbi Nachman which seems to say you can become a tzaddik. I don't know whether a tzaddik means you're enlightened, but I guess it seems to make sense that that's true. But enlightenment is something that just, I would say, comes after incredible spiritual investment in Torah and mitzvahs and God realization, right? And it's not being separate from this world. More on that now. Enlightenment and spiritual realizations are moments which are meant to be enjoyed and grabbed, but let go. You see, when this guy had awakened or anyone else who thinks they just got it, they know what God is, that's not God. Because if you think you grasp God, you grasp finity. As it says in the Zohar, ain't to feast obey. There's no grasp of him. You get a grasp of something infinite. You get a real grasp, but then it's gone. It's like trying to grab on the present. The present is always moving. You grab onto God and then you have to let go, right? That, I want to say, is the problem it says in Parshish Mishpatim when all the people went up to God. It says Moshe and Aaron, Nadav and Avihu and the 70 Zikanim, the elders, went up and they saw God and they ate and drank. They had the spiritual experience of God and then they tried to hold on to that. They tried to eat it and drink it and make it part of them. You have to let go of those experiences. This oneness, this connection to God, it's for a moment. You can't become permanently enlightened. It doesn't seem like he's not a regular person. I don't know. Ishbitz Rudzin says a similar thing, back to the Navan Avihu thing. We know Navan Avihu went in to the Holy of Holies. And we know later in, um, 
in the in, in Achrei Mos, we know later in Achrei Mos that it says you should do what they did by going into the Holy of Holies with the proper reverence, with the proper fear, but only on Yom Kippur on this one day. So the Ishbitz Ritzin tradition has a, a Torah which says, why is it that when the Kohen Gadol goes into the Holy of Holies, he doesn't pray? But when he leaves the Holy of Holies, he prays. He prays, you know, has his prayer. You see it in the Yom Kippur service. They say because when you're in that experience, the Holy of Holy experience, you don't pray. You're connected. You're so high. It's all one. It's all connected. You don't need to pray. You're there. You accept. You accept the way things are. It's all one. But you don't stay there forever. You leave. You can't stay high forever. You leave. And then when he leaves and you go back to your regular reality, that's when he makes the prayer. That's when the can't be there all the time. You get those moments and you let go, right? They saw at the splitting of the sea, everyone saw, Ze'eli van Veyu, this is my God. But then a few days later, three days later at Mara, they were all bitter and looking for water. You can see that you can't grab these moments all the time. These guys who claim they're awakened or they're enlightened, they're, they're not. They're not. The people who may be enlightened, like these tzadikim, these people, they're not going around telling people that. They don't think they are. Right? They're not telling people that. They need to make a video about talking about how enlightened they are. Well, the last point I want to make is, the, again, the, the physical question about God being a deceiver. So if God's a deceiver, then why does he create this world? Why does he create the physical world? Why does he create an ego which makes us seem separate, which creates materialism? So, again, unless you want to go into this, you know, the idea, the Christian idea, like, well, you have to transcend that and forget this world and move on to the next world, and that's the idea. I don't think that's the correct idea, though you do find strains of that in Judaism as well. I think the Hasidic idea of a Vodah the idea that we serve God within the world, doing the mitzvahs, the system of mitzvahs, the Torah, is the enlightenment. It's finding God in the now. Taste God and He's good. You say a blessing on food, use that food to do good things, to work, to spend time with your family. That is serving God in this world. It's not about becoming a hermit and living on a mountaintop. It's not about, you know, renouncing this world and becoming a martyr. It's about serving God in this world. And the mitzvahs are the light, they're the advice that God gives us to bring that spiritual light within the world. That has no issue of a deceiver God at all. God gives the mitzvahs and the Torah in order to give us merit, to give us spirituality, to give us light. That's what Torah is. It's not a deceiver God, as Paul would claim according to the, the the Lutheran tradition, that he just created that as an intermediate to leave all this behind and go to the next world, which is the thing. No, we have this world. God's not a deceiver God. God has our portion in this world, and that portion is to bring light to do good in this world. You, when you do these, these mitzvahs, when you do these commandments, these connections, because that's what they are, the word mitzvah means connection, you connect the world, this world which seems broken, to a world, a bigger world. And you could have those moments of oneness, of spirituality and light. But they're few and far between. You can't expect it all the time. The more you work on it, the more you can get. But the main point is just to be simple, to be connected, to do the light, bring the mitzvahs into the world. That is the main idea of the world. Enlightenment is something that may come in its own for the, or may be planted for the select few. But for someone to go around and claiming they're enlightened in this world doesn't matter. You're saying that God is evil. You're saying that God's a deceiver and that God created this world as an illusion for you to get past. I don't think so. We're in this world. Let's make the best of what we have. Thank you very much. This is Adam Law with Wanderings. You can be in touch with me if you want to book a coaching or psychotherapy call. And I wish all the best to you. Be well.